21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Chasing him where? Now, who is it, a police officer? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what building did he run into? What is that, 452 or 492? Oh, was he man armed? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. I'll send the officers right over there. No, you just stand there in front of the building. Tell them where to go, okay? Yeah. Thanks. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. The weather had turned exceedingly cold, and consequently it had been a quiet night in the precinct. Cold weather, like rain, keeps the troublemakers off the streets. After my meal, I had gone out on patrol of the precinct in sector car number two with patrolman William Coley as operator, and I remained away from the station house until nearly 10 p.m., inspecting various conditions in the precinct and responding to several radio calls along with the sector cars and the sergeant. At 9.50, a call came over the air to ring into the station house. I instructed Patrolman Coley to stop at the nearest call box. Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, informed me that Lieutenant Matt King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad, wanted to see me as soon as possible on an urgent matter. I told the desk officer to inform Lieutenant King that I was on my way in. I instructed Patrolman Coley to drive to the station house, where, after stopping at the desk to sign the blotter, I walked through the back room, up the stairs to the second floor and into the office of the 21st Detective Squad. Hello, Captain. Hello. Where's Lieutenant King? In his office, Captain. Uh, he asked me to ring in there when you got here. Okay. Who's with him? It's Patrick, Captain, and a suspect. Sergeant, would you ring Lieutenant King's line? Yeah, thank you. What's doing tonight, Pete? Oh, nothing too much, Captain. It's been pretty quiet. Battalion, Lieutenant. Captain Kennelly's out here. Okay. Yes, sir. He's coming right out, Captain. All right. Three guys were in here within an hour. Every one of them had his overcoat stolen. Mm, that's a sure sign of winter, Pete. Yes, sir. It's better than the calendar. Mm. Well, I'm glad you'd come in, Captain. It's all right, Matt. What have you got? Did you come over here a minute? Yeah. Pitts brought a boy in here. The boy's got a pretty wild story. About what, man? About a cop taking $700 off him. Yeah? Where? Up on Lexington Avenue. Oh, so, can he identify the cop? He says he can. Who's he supposed to be? He just says he can identify him. He doesn't know who it is. Okay, who is this boy, man? His name's Augie Bookham. Yeah? He's been pushing narcotics up there as long as we know him. He's done two bits on it. Fitz spotted him on the street and went over to talk to him. He lit out. Fitz chased him into a building and collared him on the roof. Well, how does a cop taking $700 off him figure into it? Maybe you want to hear that from Augie. I'd like to. You think he's giving you a straight story, man? I don't know, Captain. Vitaly. Yes, sir? Hold up my calls for a while. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Captain. Oh, Vince. Captain? Captain, this is Augie Bookham, Captain Kennelly, commanding officer of the precinct. Glad to know you, Captain. You told these detectives a cop took $700 off him? Is that right? I wouldn't have called him if it wasn't. When was it? Tonight, about 8.30. Just a little while before he jumped me, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Where? Right up there, near there. He said he was standing under the marquee of that old picture house there, Captain. I was waiting to meet a fella. The car drove up, and the cop got out to talk to him. The police officer was all alone? Yeah, all alone. By himself. And he was in a car? Yeah, squad car, you know. Do you know who this police officer is? Well, I don't know his name. I've seen him around the neighborhood. He's been around a long time. Was he in uniform? Yeah, he's in uniform. What kind of car was it? Regular police car, I told you that. Well, what did it say on the side of the car? What do you mean? Well, what was written there? Oh, uh, 2-1 precinct. I saw that, 2-1 precinct. All the men in cars ride with partners. Where was the other police officer? Listen, don't ask me. There was only the one. 
How come he stopped to talk to you? Were you causing a disturbance there? No, I was just standing there waiting for this friend of mine. Well, then, how come he stopped? Listen, I'm the kind of a guy when a cop sees me, he stops to talk to me. Ain't that right? Ask Mr. Fitzpatrick here. I got a natural attraction for cops. All right. The car pulled up and he got out. What happened then? Well, listen, I told these fellas all about it. Let them tell you. I don't feel like going over and over it. You'll go over it plenty. You'll come in here, Augie, and made a statement about a police officer being guilty of misconduct. The captain's job to find out the identity of that police officer. Oh. Well, you answer his questions. All right. If I got it, I got it. You got it. He got out of the car and walked over to you. Yeah. What did he say? I said, hello, Augie. He knew your name? I told you. Everybody knows my name. But you didn't know his. No, I didn't know. I didn't care. All right, then what'd he say? He said, when'd you get out? You see, I've been doing this bit over Rikers Island. What for? The same old thing. Misdemeanor, Captain. Reduced from a felony on a plea of guilty. Then what? Well, I told him when I got out, so he said, maybe I'm going back. He said, stick my hands up against the wall there, and I did. He looked me over. Oh, what'd he find? He found a $700. And what else? Oh, he had six quarters of eight in my shed. He found them. An ounce and a half of heroin. Yeah, so he said, Augie, this time you get the book. No more Rikers Island. This is a big time rap for sure. And I said, well, what can I do? So he said, go on, get in the car. I started to go over, get in the car. Then he said, wait a minute. So I waited a minute. Yeah. And the cop said to me, he said, look, Augie, you're an idiot. I told him I agreed with him because I can count on myself to get in a jam like this every time. So he says, why do I lay myself open for a felony by carrying more than a quarter ounce? You see, the guy's carved with more than an ounce. They got some gimmick that he's got it to sell, prima facie, something like that. Yeah, we know what the law is. Well, that's two to 15 years. Between a full ounce and a quarter ounce is still a felony, possession. But under a quarter is a misdemeanor, just another couple months at Rikers Island. So? So I agreed with him I was an idiot. But I had to carry all that good because I was just going to make a meet. It was only my wish I had less than a quarter on me, or preferably none at the time. So he says, how would I like that wish to come through? I said, what do you mean? Then he says, supposing we only take a quarter into the station house. I was beginning to get the idea. I said, how could that be arranged? So he wondered, wouldn't I like to trade the 700 for about seven years? Yeah. Well, that didn't seem like too bad a trade to me. So he took five of the quarters and threw them in a pile of junk there. And he took the other quarter and the seven bills and put them in his pocket. And he said, come on. So we walked over to the car. Why didn't he bring you in? Oh, wait, I'm coming to that. We walked over to the car. He opened up the door. He was thinking, I guess, when we walked over there. He had the seven bills. He didn't need me. So he put his foot up in the car. He said to me with a wink light, he said, Augie, I got to tie my shoe. When I got my back turned, don't you go walking away. Well, the way he said it, I figured that was just what he wanted me to do. Well, Rikers Island is better than 2 to 15, but nothing is better yet than Rikers Island. And so by the time he got through tying his shoe, I was halfway down the block already. Then what did you do? Well, I stood in the door down the block there till I saw him get in the car and take off. So I figured I'm out seven bills, but I'm off cheap. The five quarters were still laying there on a pile of junk where he threw it, under the old movie house there. So I walked back to get it. Why shouldn't I? I just picked it up. I'm heading back out, and somebody hollers Augie. I looked around. It's him, Mr. Fitzpatrick. There I was with five quarters on me and not another cent to make a trade. So what was I going to do? I lit out. Him after me. Ain't that right? I took out our CRT, yeah. How far did you chase him, Fitz? Around the corner, Captain. I saw him duck into this tenement building. Started up the stairs and went all the way to the roof. I'd have been all right, too, except I didn't know the building. There was this big iron railing on the roof, so I couldn't jump the next roof. Did you still have the evidence on him when you called on him? Yes, sir. Now, that's the shaver, but I was so worried about getting away, I forgot all about it. I was carrying a load. What did he say to you when you called him? He wanted to know why we couldn't leave him alone. I told him if he'd stop pushing H, we'd leave him alone. Did he mention the $700 then? No, sir. Not until I was on the way back to the station house with him. What did he say? He said he'd take care of me if he had the money, but... He didn't have the money just then. And he got high and mighty, so I told him about the other cop. What time was it that you called him, Fitz? About ten minutes after nine, Captain. And then it uh, would have been approximately between 8.45 and 9 o'clock that he met the officer under the theater marquee. Yes, sir, approximately. Would you say that's right, Augie? About right, yeah, approximately. Augie, would you be able to recognize this officer that took the $700 on you? Any place, any place in the world. Fitz? Yes, sir. Take him outside, Fitz. Get it down on paper. Again? Yeah, again. Yeah, all right. Come on, Augie. Hey, listen. Hey, what's all this going to get me? What do you want it to get you, Augie? Well, I mean, I'm entitled to some consideration, don't you think? You were colored with an ounce and a half of heroin in your possession. You know what that'll get you. All right, you got a cop that took $700 off me. You want to get that straightened out. You got me with an ounce and a half of H on me. I want to get that straightened out. I'll help you on that. You help me on this. We can trade out a little bit. Augie, 
You've done enough trading for one night. Take him outside. Yes, sir. Outside where? Come on, Augie. Come on, let's go. I'm going. Yeah, looks like a rough one, Captain. Yeah. I don't know. He tells a pretty straight story. And with these bums, you can't believe a word they're saying. Don't kid yourself, Matt. He was pretty convincing. Oh, can I use this? Yes, sir. Sure. This is Captain Kennelly, Sergeant. Yes, sir. How long have you been on TS duty? It's 8 o'clock, Captain. Have you taken your meal? Yes, sir. 7 8. All right. Tell Lieutenant Gorman to get a man to relieve you on the switchboard. Yes, sir. Then bring the radio log and the telephone switchboard record up to Lieutenant King's office. Right away, Captain? Yes, right away. Okay, Captain. Have you got any idea who it might be, Captain? We will have, Matt. As soon as we find out who it couldn't have been. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. Allegations of misconduct by members of the force are handled according to established procedure. In an organization of more than 20,000 men and women, incidents of this sort are anticipated and appropriate action is provided. In the event of delinquency, a delinquency that is of a minor nature, machinery is provided for disciplinary action following a departmental trial presided over by a deputy commissioner. On a determination of guilty at this trial, the punishment can range from a reprimand to dismissal from the department, depending on the nature of the complaint. If, as in this case, the allegations are of a criminal nature, a full investigation is made and the facts turned over to the district attorney concerned in one of the five counties that make up the city of New York. When the charges against a member of the force originate with a civilian, the desk officer of the precinct enters the complaint in the blotter exactly as recited. A transcript is then prepared and forwarded to the inspector commanding the division who assigns a superior officer above the rank of lieutenant to make an investigation. When the identity of the police officer concerned is unknown or uncertain, the commanding officer of the precinct must conduct a preliminary investigation to determine the identity. It was in this connection that I instructed Sergeant Waters to bring the telephone switchboard record and radio log to Lieutenant King's office. Yes. Sergeant Waters. Come in. Oh, come in, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Uh, sit down here. Where do you want these, Captain? On the table, sir. Okay, Lieutenant. All right. Let's see your entries in the telephone switchboard record. For this tour? Yeah. Yes, sir? Uh, you've got five sector cars on the street. Yes, sir. Who's in them? Meister and Farrell are number one. Coley and Mercado are number two. And Hein and Ziegler are number three. Kane and Scully are number four. And Bolney and Barr are number five. Who's the operator of the sergeant's car? Lamar, Lieutenant. Uh, was the sergeant's car on a job between, say, uh, 8.30 and 9.15? Look in the radio line. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They were down at Bellevue on an aided case. An auto accident on First Avenue. Child injured. They were at Bellevue from 8.40 to 9.5. Then back in 7. Well, that puts the sergeant's car out of it, Captain. Yep. Sectors 2, 4, and 5 come together pretty close up there. Uh, sergeant, were any of the men in sector cars 2, 4, or 5 taking a meal around that same time? Yes, sir. Bauer in car number 5 was on his meal period from 8 to 9. Well, that means that Bolney was on patrol alone in the car during that time. Yes, sir. Oh, and McCarter was also taking a meal 8 to 9. Coley was number two. And I was on patrol with Coley during that time. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. What about number four, Sergeant? Well, neither of them had a meal during that time. As a matter of fact, they were on a job. They had a case on 93rd Street, an old lady overcome from a gas case, one of those defective hot water heaters. Well, that kept them pretty well tied up until about 9.15. Yes, I was over there for a while. I saw them. Uh, Sergeant, you had these two jobs, the gas case and the child injured. You didn't instruct any of the other cars to move up into that territory during that time. No, sir. We were adequately covered up there. And see that telephone record, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Oh, see, this shows car five's ringing time is 35. Boldy rang in five minutes late, 8.40. Yes, sir. And what was his explanation? He told me he was on a job. There was a fight in a candy store, and he had a time breaking it up. His partner was taking his meal then. Boldy was alone in the car. Yes, sir, that's right. Well, did he make any arrest? No, sir. He said it was just uh, three or four kids. Broke it up and sent him on home. And that's why he rang in five minutes late. 
That's what he said, Captain. That call box 14, that's up on Lexington near the closed movie house there, isn't it, Sergeant? That's right, Lieutenant. This fight, uh, did you get a call on that job, Sergeant? No, sir. Well, it wasn't broadcast. It doesn't show on the radio log. Oh, Bolney told me he was riding by and someone flagged him down. What candy store was it, did he say? Yes, sir. He mentioned it was Mrs. Protea's yeah. up there on 98th Street. You know the one, Captain. Yes, I know it. Okay, get back on the job, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, should I take these with me, Captain? Yeah, take them along. Uh, thank you, Captain. Okay. Shut the door, will you, Sergeant? Yes, sir. You figure it might be Balney, eh, Captain? Well, from the records, it couldn't have been anyone else. And he was alone in the car at the time. Partner was taking a meal. It all fits. Yes, sir. It all fits. It all fits too well. With Lieutenant King, I went downstairs into the muster room and around behind the desk where I signed the blotter. On the street, Lieutenant King directed me to the spot where the detective squad car was parked. We got into it and drove uptown on Park Avenue past block after block of fine apartment houses until we reached the point where the New York Central tracks emerged from the 50-block tunnel to Grand Central Terminal. There, Park Avenue becomes a thoroughfare through the slums. We turned into 98th Street and drove until we came to the small candy store run by Mrs. Angelina Portia, a middle-aged widow who succeeded her husband in the business. Yeah, she's still open, Captain. Good. You want to talk to her? Or should I? Oh, I'll talk to her. Okay. What about Balney? Any previous complaints against him? No, nothing of any kind. No, that's good. He's alone in there. No. Go ahead, man. Oh. Hello. How have you been? Hello, Miss Portia. This is Lieutenant King. Miss Portia. Lieutenant King, Lieutenant King. We've met. We've met. Yes. When you caught the robbers, they came in here and took my money, and I came to the police station. Last year, remember? Remember when you caught the robbers, the two men? Oh, yes, I remember. Not the last time, when there was only one robber with a knife. It was the time before, when there were two robbers, one with a gun. Uh, the two boys from 113th Street. That's right. <laughs> What's the matter? You could never find the one robber with a knife, huh? He got more money from me. Maybe we'll still get him someday. Uh, Miss Portia. Yeah. Yeah, Captain. Oh, a nice soda gentleman, huh? A plain chocolate all with ice cream. No, no, thank you. Oh, go on, have a soda. No, thank you, Miss Portia. All right. Miss Portia, was there a fight in here tonight? A fight? Yeah, in the store here. Was there any kind of disturbance? Not a fight, exactly. The boys were in here, the boys from the block. An argument. There wasn't a fight? All right, it was a fight. But they didn't fight much, they didn't hit hard. The boys fight almost every night. Did a policeman come in and break it up? A policeman? Yeah, was there a policeman in here tonight? No, no policeman came in here. Excuse me, the telephone. You're sure? I'm positive. Hello? Who? Oh, he don't live here. This is the candy store. He lives upstairs next door. What? Yeah, you're sure? I'll tell him. What? Well, wait a minute. I I've got to write it down. Academy 2. What? Academy 2, 3098. I've got it. Who? Jose. All right. All right, I'll tell him. Very important. I won't forget. Goodbye. Yo, goodbye. Telephone numbers. I've got to take all I've got to do. Telephone numbers. No, uh, let me get this straight, Miss Portilla. You said that no policeman came into the store tonight. That's right. No policeman came into the store. Now, what about the fight? In here, it was no fight. Didn't get to be a fight until it was out on the sidewalk. Was there a policeman there? Yeah, sure. Who do you think stopped the fight? They would have been dead, those boys. Well, the fight started in here. In here, it wasn't a fight yet. It was still an argument. It was between Phil and Ricardo. Only this little Fernando butted in. Fernando was always turning an argument into a fight. <laughs> a big fight. I said, boys, boys, not in the store. So they went out on the sidewalk, and they hit and they poked. Well, they were killing each other with little Fernando right in the middle. I was out there. I tried to stop them. Man from next door tried to stop him. Nobody could stop until the policeman came. How did he come? In a car. I saw the car come down the street. I got out in the middle and yelled and screamed. He stopped the car and he got out. He stopped the fight. Was he all alone? You mean any other cops? Yeah, more than? No, no, himself. That's all. Just himself. Now, how long did he stay here? Oh, a long time. 
Bill and Ricardo, as soon as he said stop, they stopped. But this little Fernando, he wanted to fight. He wanted to fight Phil. He wanted to fight Ricardo. He wanted to fight with everybody. Uh, was the officer here uh, 15 minutes, would you say? More. More. He had to first get Phil to go home, and then Ricardo. Fernando, he didn't want to go home. Policeman had to stand there with him and talk to him and talk to him. Fifteen years old, and he wants to fight like a bull. <laughs> so little like this, and all he wants to do is to punch and fight and hit. He, uh, was here about, uh, 20 minutes, you'd say? The policeman or Fernando? The policeman. At least, at least 20 minutes. You remember what time this was, Miss Portillo? Oh, tonight. It was tonight. Yes, but do you happen to remember exactly what time? Exactly what time. Now, let me see. All the news in the mirror went up yet. What time did the papers get here? Quarter to nine. Nine o'clock usually, sometimes in between. Oh, when the boys came in, I was listening to the radio to that, um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. North. You know who I mean, uh, Pam and her husband. What time is that program on? It's 8 to 8.30, Captain. Yeah, yeah, 8 to 8.30 is right. And the fight started, and they ran outside, and I ran outside. I didn't get to hear who killed the lady of the program. Did you hear it, do you know? No, I didn't hear it. Uh, were you out on the sidewalk until the policeman left? Then he left. Everybody left. I came inside the store, and Arthur Godfrey was on already. You know, with the contestants, I missed the first contestant. Beginning of the first contestant. I heard the last of him. Oh, and that must have been about uh, 25 minutes to 9? About, uh, yeah, about. Uh, you know this policeman that was here? Uh, not here. On the sidewalk, outside. Yeah, do you know him? To say hello, not his name. Okay, Matt. You're a captain. I don't think we need anything else. Thanks a lot, Miss Portia. You're a lot of help. Are you sure no soda? Positive, thanks. Bye. You keep your eye on that little Fernando, huh? We will, Miss Portia. Well, you better. So long. Bye, Miss Portia. Goodbye. Well, Captain, it just about puts everybody in the clear. Ah, sure does. You got a match? Yes, sir. Sure. You know what I think, Matt? Here you go. I think Augie, you was telling one great big lie from beginning to end. There's no doubt about that, Captain. I'd just like to know why. What do you say we go and find out? We walked to the car, got in, and drove back to the station house. I stopped at the desk to sign the blotter, and Lieutenant King went on upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad, where Detective Fitzpatrick had Augie Bookham in custody. At the desk, Lieutenant Gorman told me that things were quiet in the precinct, and I walked through the back room, up the stairs, and into the detective squad office. Did uh, Lieutenant King go into his office, Steve? Yes, sir. He and Fitzpatrick, uh, and that suspect. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. Yes? Captain Canelli. Come in, Captain. Hello, Fitz. Captain. Captain, Augie's got a one-track mind. He still says the cop took $700 off him. Isn't that what you say, Augie? What's the truth? The honest to goodness truth. Now, look, Augie. You came in here with a wild story. We wasted an awful lot of time looking into it. There were five cars in this precinct. At the time you said you talked to that cop, every one of them was on a job or otherwise occupied. It's all a matter of record, black and white. Now, how about telling us the truth? You guys just want to protect this cop, that's all. I don't want to protect anyone, Augie. But I'm telling you that I'm not going to stand for a bum like you coming in here and giving us some line of bull about something that never happened, that he dreamed up. I wasted a lot of time on this, Augie. I want the truth right now. How about it? Okay, you want the truth. I'll give you the truth. That's what we want. Nobody took any 700 off them. They didn't, No. No. All right, tell me how you happened to dream it up. I was supposed I had 700. I was holding it for some guy, but I dropped it in a crap game. The tough guy's a real brute. I didn't know what I was going to tell him. So you figured the best thing to tell him was a cop to the Arthur. Well, that'd be reasonable for him to believe, wouldn't it? I don't know, would it? Yeah, he'd believe that. See, he got collared yesterday. He's down the tombs now. I was supposed to take the 700 to a bondsman to make his bail. He's laying down there in the tombs getting madder and madder. What do you think he's going to do to me when I show up in the same jail? He's going to get the 700 out of my jaw one tooth at a time. i got to have a reasonable story for him. Yeah, sure. And almost ruin an officer's life. Well, I'm sorry about that. Augie, you've got a heart of gold. That's my big trouble, you know. But not your only trouble. You're telling me I'm up, I'm up to here with troubles. I'm sorry. What more can I say? Nothing, Augie. 
I think you said just about enough for one night. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Well, what do you mean he's missing? Missing from where? Yeah. Yeah. Well, how old is he? Twelve years or twelve months? Well, is that the residence there? What apartment number? What? All right, take it easy. Talk into the phone. All right. I'll send the officers right over there. And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were John Shea, Bill Quinn, John Sylvester, and Abby Lewis. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Artana speaking. <laughs>